Welcome everyone back to the Serene Stage. I'm Sophie Edelman uh, and I am delighted to be joined by Eleanor and Marcelo here today to talk about being a founder and a parent. People asking me whether or not I was nervous about coming on stage today. After having given birth to two children, I have to say nothing is scary. <laughs> so we are here because we're all founders of companies and we're all parents and between us, we have six children under the age of seven. So lots of experience with the juggle. <laughs> now today we wanted to share with you the good, the bad and the ugly of being a founder and a parent. What we're gonna to cover today is everything from starting a company and the decision to do that and combine that with a family, fundraising fears and making sure that both your family and your company get the best out of you so that you don't burn out. And we all agreed when we were talking about this session that we wanted to be really real with you today. We want you to be able to come away with an understanding of what we, what we think of the challenges and the joys of being a founder and a parent. And we want you to come away and leave today with some really practical tips of how we make it work that you can hopefully apply in your own lives. So first of all, delighted to have you guys. Great Let's hear your here. stories. What were your journeys to becoming both a founder and a parent. I'll start with you, Eleanor. Sure, so hi everyone. Uh, Eleanor Crespo, co-founder, co-CEO of Pigment. We started the company in mid 2019 and I had twins 18 months ago. So actually, approximately on a year and a half after creating Pigment. So I'll tell Incredible. you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> twins is a, is a whole other story. <laughs> Marcelo, what about you? Yeah, so um, I'm CEO and co-founder, a remote. And my kid was born four months after we started this company. So uh, January uh, 2019, we started remote, and April, my kid was born. Uh, so I've been raising two kids <laughs> at the same time. Well, and also in the middle of a pandemic as yeah. well, which has its own complexities. So the first thing is, you decide that you're going to have a family. How do you tell people? Maybe you, you get, in Eleanor, in my case, you get pregnant. The decision to tell your, your co-founders, your investors, your team, what was your journey on that? How did you do that? Yeah, so for me, it was very natural. I think the only thing I maybe regret is that, you know, there is something when you're pregnant that you have to wait three months usually before telling everyone. And I think it's just a sort of common practice, which I found a bit ridiculous because uh, I was telling Sophie that unfortunately during the first three months of my pregnancy, I was sick, but like I wanted to throw up every single minute and I was in meeting all day long. And I wish that I was really able to tell people because at the end of the day, I don't think it's, you know, maybe some Something bad will happen, yes, but maybe something bad can happen after three months as well. So um, I told my co-founder straight away, and I had to wait, obviously, two other months to tell, uh, to tell, for instance, my investors, etc. I found it very natural, and I remember that some people that I speak with, as I, I spoke with at the time, were a bit freaking out, like, "Oh, how are you going to, how are you going to manage that?" And I found it a little bit. Um, I didn't really like that idea of, of, of freaking out because um, I realized that you know my co-founder has three daughters under the age of nine, and no one ever asked him like how do you cope with three kids. So I was like, look, you know, yes, I'm going to have twins, but as everybody else, you know, uh, I will just deal with my twins as as much as uh, all the other founders do. So that was uh, my easy answer. But yeah, I think other than that, uh, everything went super smoothly in terms of announcing the the birth. Yeah. I, I I understand. That, that fear of being pregnant and not knowing you know, when to tell people. I remember with my first child, I waited until I was five and a half months pregnant. And I'm pretty sure everybody knew that I was pregnant by this point um, because I was really scared. I was really scared that people were gonna judge me differently, that they were gonna think I wasn't gonna be able to perform. Um, so it is a really difficult decision, but I, I don't know about you, I felt a lot of relief once I told everyone um, and hopefully it didn't affect anything I did. So, yeah. Marcella, how about you? Well, slightly different for me, of course, because um, my, my wife was the one uh, being pregnant. The, the best part about it is, you know, w even though it's your own company, but it is a job. Right? It's a job for literally everyone in that company. And so you should also set the expectations and the, the, what is the reality that people should expect on the day to day. And so as a founder, if you also make a big fuss out of it, you know, so you're going to be leading others to think, well, you know, being pregnant or becoming a parent is 
you know, uh, sort of a hush-hush thing. So, you know, super open about it. In my case, I had to go through sort of two moments, one less positive because my, my kid was born with a club feet, which is a, a, a not a great uh, thing to be born with. His feet were uh, turned inside, inside out, um, outside in. And so I had to tell people, look, uh, we discovered mid-pregnancy. We're already ongoing with the company. And I said, look, it's going to be crazy um, at, at best. I'm going to be out for a few days a week because it requires a lot of, you know, I Googled everything that you could possibly Google uh, during that period. I told people, look, I'm going to have to go out for therapy a few hours or even days per week. Um, and that's that. Um, yeah. But such is life. Well, one of the big things, it's not just announcing, but it's how do you handle parental leave, right? The decision of what you communicate to your team, to your investors. I know. For me, my fear was around what the investors would think. Um, how, did, how did you both think about the parental leave process and, um, and how long did you take? Were you involved? That kind of thing. Marcelo, what about you? Yeah, so one of the big reasons why I started this company with, with Yo, my co-founder, was you know, there has to be a big shift from living to work and work to live. It's a very different thing. And so the parental leave, unfortunately, we, we're still in a, we're still catching up with what the reality should be. Many countries are, you know, very upfront and very, you know, real with the needs of both parents, right? It's tough on everyone. And so it should be about what makes sense and what are the needs of people and not like, hey, hey in this country you have three months, get through with shit, you know? Kids are completely different. Some kids need a lot more than three months in order for you to regain some sense of self, let alone freedom to work. Um, and to that end, you know, what we always try to push for is, you know, the time you work is not the same as the quality of what you do. And for you to be at your best point, you also have to be well. So uh, someone that, you know, became a parent recently can't go to work thinking 99% of the time, how's my baby doing? Mm -hmm. And to me, that is something that's very critical and why we have a policy at remote that you, know, you should really take the time. And if you need more time, you take, need more time. And that's it, period. That's great. I think we're going to talk a bit more about sort of the impact on you as an employer in a minute. Um, Eleanor, what about you? How did you approach your maternity leave, your parental leave, and, <laughs> and how did you handle that with your, your partner? That kind of thing. Yeah, so first of all, uh, with twins, normally you have to stop uh, earlier, and unfortunately I couldn't, so I had to start to work until the, pretty much the last day. So that was, uh, you know, it's also something you have to take into account is that uh, uh, the, the way you can work when you're pregnant of twins, and it's probably the same when you're pregnant of, of, of one, but it's, it's, it's not easy in the, in, the, in the last few months as well. So it, it meant that really, you know, I, I was already pretty tired uh, before, before giving birth. But the reality, what happened after after giving birth, is that we got interest from investors. And just to give you some context, we are uh, today we are post Series B. We are 200 employees, and at the time, clearly investor came to us to uh, to offer us to raise a, a, an early Series B. And uh, that was last summer. And my kids were one month old. And I can tell you that the problem is also, as you probably all know, twins, they are always born premature. So they were very small. They were not sleeping at all. They had a lot of stomach issues, or you name it. So we had like, and like really like we were beyond tired. There is no word to describe. But where I got super, super, super lucky is that my husband works for this American company that gave him five months of parental leave. And I have to say that this was a complete lifesaver. I had that. On top of that, I, had, I was very lucky to have my grandparents and my family and, uh, and uh, my parents helping. Uh, but I have to say that being a founder, a mother, if your husband works, it's just not feasible. Like, it's just not feasible because there is no way for me, like with twins, I have normally in France, you have nine months of parental leave. So it's a pretty long time. It was absolutely impossible for me to take these nine months. And as much as I would love to lead by example, there are certain stages of the company, and we were in a stage where I really couldn't let go. Perhaps, you know, in three, four years from now, it would have been easier to say, okay, bye, you know, I'm back in nine months. It was totally impossible. And I think we will talk more about that, but the logistics around you, 
like there is no, it's not negotiable. It's just not negotiable. And you have to think about that way ahead to make sure that you're prepared. And I'm not saying that everyone should do fundraising with a, a one month old kid. And just to tell you, it's also feasible. You know, it's something I did. And you know, I did it as a normal course of business. And actually it was great because it, you know, it forces me to like really think about how to be super impactful and super fast. And you know, we were able to wrap the round in no time. And I told the investors, right, like, look, I have no time at all. So, you know, I'm going to give you this day, two hours here, there, and we wrap it up. So that was great. But nothing is impossible. You just need the logistics. Yeah, I'll share a little bit of my story on that. So with my, um, my second child, I was uh, co-founder and president of Multiverse, my, my previous company. We were about 150 people. And I remember when uh, I was pregnant, I told the team about my maternity leave. My plan was to take about nine weeks. And I put together this document this plan of how I was going to ramp up over those nine weeks back to sort of 80 percent. Obviously, that went completely out the window. I had this either very clear plan of what I'm going to do. But I remember saying to my team, what I choose to do is my decision. This is not my expectation for you. And I think as founders, particularly to Eleanor's point, like we, we have a different risk tolerance. We have a different expectation um, of ourselves. This is a, one of our babies to be able to clearly say to our teams, we may only take four weeks, two weeks, nine weeks. Um, that's not necessarily our expectation of you. You need to do what's right for you and your family, I think is a really important message um, and, and a, the right way to hopefully role model to them. Because as we all believe, you know, family is really, really important. So fundraising, let's go to, to fundraising. I know, I know you said you were fundraising at one month. Did, did either of you have negative sort of reception from investors when, when you said you were planning on starting a family or you had kids or you're pregnant? So um, not in my case. In my case, um, all of our investors are parents, I believe. And, you know, I remember we were going through the first fundraising when my kid was born and uh, we had, you know, we, our fundra first fundraising happened in less than two weeks. And I had this scheduled call for over a month uh, to meet that investor, which started off as being just a saying hi call, but ended up being, hey, we'll, we're going to be raising. And so both of us, we only had that slot available. I had time off. I, I thought I was going to be on holiday. And he was in travel, doing traveling. So my kid decided to come out. Uh, <laughs> and. You, know, you can't plan was, these things. <laughs> absolutely. So he was due like a week from there. So it was fine until a certain 6 a.m. And, and then, you know, he was born. And after a while, we were in the room, like two hours, four hours later, we're in the room and he's asleep next to, you know, my wife was, you know, always passing out of exertion. And, and I, I see a number on my phone. I'm like, who's calling me? No, it was a foreigner number. At the time, I wasn't really calling. I, I always sort of kind of rude to call someone on the phone. So, uh, but I, for some reason, I picked up. I, I stepped aside from the room and I picked up. And it was this investor and I said, hey, by the way, I just became a dad. Uh, whatever you have to say, we, should, we need to do it in 10 minutes. And <laughs> uh, so we spoke for like 10 minutes and it was it. And I felt like, well... You know, if you're fundraising and if you're trying to show the best, that was literally the, the most rushed elevator pitch ever. But honestly, I couldn't care less. It worked out well. You know, I ended up not investing because it was too late in the race. So we closed the round faster, but we stayed good friends. Yeah. Um, and so. You set expectations and you put your priorities first. Yeah. I don't know. How about you? Did any, any negative experiences in investors? I would say that... Uh, Something I want to share is that if one day an investor comes to you and question uh, and asks you questions about that, it's not a good investor. Uh, because we are here to build companies in the long term, and usually good investors are looking for companies that will build over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And it would be completely silly to imagine that us as founders would not have kids during that period of time. So we are not monks. We're, we're here to build our personal life uh, in parallel to a professional life. So and means regardless, of, obviously, of whether you're a woman or, or a man as well. So 
um, I, I know that some investors ask me some questions, and straight away I know that these are not people I want around the table, because I think a good investor should come to me and say, what help do you need to actually be able to run your company while having twins? That's just what I'm expecting. So how can I help you get there? And um, luckily enough, you know, the investors that we have at Pigment are more than supportive and always here to ask me, you know, how things are going, how, you know, I'm uh, actually happily planning my life uh, in between, etc. So we, we are very lucky, but it's also because we carefully pick them in that direction. I think that's the, the great question, right? How can I support you? How can I help you? How can I make your life easier? Not how are you going to cope, which assumes that you're not going to cope, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I definitely had one of those experiences. <laughs> and that person won't be named, but um, I think then setting, being very clear with them that, you know, we decided to start companies, we can, we can cope. Nothing is impossible to your point. But that's a great segue into talking a bit about work-life balance. Marcella, you alluded to this a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about the practicalities, the logistics of managing, running a company, and having a family. Like, how do you cope? What do you do? Eleanor, give me some of your, your hot tips. Sure. So first of all, I think we are both uh, leading fast, fast, fast growing companies, right? Like our companies are growing massively fast, so I don't know if it's an example that everybody should follow, but it's probably kind of the hardcore example of what a parent can be and a founder at the same time. So warning, because uh, it can be very different from one company to the next. So for me, I more think about it more that how many hours I work is more how many hours can I spend with my family every day, uh, because obviously we work I wouldn't say 24-7, but almost. Like, it's really, you know, every time I have time, I work. So it means I have to carve out the time that I want to spend with, uh, with the kids and, and, and with my husband. So it's very simple. I have a very, very simple routine that I follow every day. It means I have zero time for myself. So let's be clear, it's hard. That's something we share, the three of us. It's hard. It's not easy. We are always tired. Like, there is no day I'm not tired. Let's be clear. Today is my holiday. I'm here alone in an hotel tonight. I can tell you it's like, it's a, like it doesn't happen for a while. And one of the, one of the trade-offs I actually make is to travel as little as possible. So usually even for a conference at Slush, I would come in the morning, leave in the evening, so that I spend as little time as possible traveling. And I also encourage my team, not only I think for, uh, for, for, for the fa fact that I have a family, but also for um, climate change concern, to take as little the, the, the plane as possible and to fly the, as little as as possible. And that also, as you see, uh, is amazing for, for, for our kids, I think. So that's something I really encourage you all to do. But long story short, in the day, simple routine. I, I spend approximately three hours a day with my kid, an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half in the evening, put them to bed, back to work. So it means uh, that's really my life every day. And weekend, I really try to carve out the time with them. But it means that when I'm with them, I am with them. And I remember this is what my nanny told me, because I was a bit like, oh my god, I don't spend enough time. Maybe they will think you are their mother. She was like, no, actually, you spend so much time. You have no idea. So many parents, actually, even like people that are employees at companies, Companies. They don't spend as much time as you do. But what is important is that whenever you are with them, your phone is away, your laptop is away, you are not doing washing machine, laundry, you are with them, playing with them, laughing with them, having fun, teaching them things. And this is really what I try to apply every day. And, uh, and with that, I, I have to say that I'm you know, having great quality time and I don't feel like a, um, I'm not spending the time I want because also, you know, the weekend is long and, and we have a lot of time to enjoy. So. That's great, thanks. Marcella, you built a company that's all about remote work. Yeah. How do you structure your day? How when do you see your kids? Yeah, I start with uh, crying in the shower, like so many minutes. Uh, very aggressive. Uh, <laughs> so my, my kid was born in a, you know, in, in soon after the pandemic started. We, our families were in a situation where due to sickness or, you know, uh, a location, they couldn't help. And so for, you know, over a year, I couldn't really visit my family at all. They couldn't visit us. So we had to, you know, raise a kid, work, all in a very small apartment. And I have a small crazy dog too. And that was not adding up uh, as, as you wanted to. So now the, the, 
what to me, you know, my wife was a, a huge support because she wanted, you know, because my kid was born with a disability, you know, she wanted to take time to actually go through all the steps and all the things with him, make sure that he had all support. So she took, she stopped working to take care of him uh, first two years of his life. But it, it real, I, we re, I realized that, you know, even in the, with all this support, if you're working, if you have a you know, six month old baby crying nonstop. My kid would sleep in cycles of 25 minutes and then 45 minutes screaming um, because of the cast and all the things. So at some point I was living off, you know, uh, sweatpants and a tracksuit because I would try to work. If he went to sleep for 25 minutes, I would try to sit back and sleep for 25 minutes wherever I could around the house. And I realized that, you know, after a bit, I was also, you know, creating a remote first company, people all across the world, no one had a working schedule. So at 2 a.m., someone would be starting their day. I ended up in a situation where, you know, I am completely beyond exhausted. I'm stressed at all the things. I'm anxious about all the things. And I realized that, you know, this, this is it, this is life. Mm -hmm. And there's not gonna be a better tomorrow if you don't build a better tomorrow. So I started to do in, in my personal life what I do at work a lot, which is hyper-prioritize. Realize that there are a few things that you are not willing to uh, you know, let go of, uh, like building time throughout the day where you're really with them. Throughout the day, if he's around, you know, we'll play a few minutes if, or you know, just do a few things together. But those are slots that are you know, unmovable, unless there's a you know, massive fire, in which case it's not very common, but something happens. But they are uh, and, and at some point I was really feeling crappy because I was not spending enough time with him. And I was feeling like he was growing up. And I, even though I was spending like time in the morning, time at the end, at the dinner and, you know, putting to, him to bed. And I was feeling really bad because I always felt like, well, there's a big portion of his life that is going by without me. Mm. Um, and probably and vice versa. There was this one day where we we're having dinner and I was on my phone and he was like, dad, put down the phone. And he was like barely three, so he could barely speak. And that hit me really hard because I realized that even though I had those slots for him, the, the ones in the middle, he, when he's with me, he doesn't really realize what I'm doing for him. You know, my, my father asked him what I do, and he was like, oh, that works like this. Beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, boop, beep. For him, I'm like, I'm in front of a computer doing things. So it's important to, you know, create boundaries, but also understanding that, you know, life goes by. And you have to be flexible and sometimes adapt to whatever comes through. Always hyper-prioritizing. Hyper-prioritize, great, great tip. Boundaries, also a great tip. We're gonna come back to some more tips in a second. Eleanor and I both, get a lot of help with our families. Can you talk a bit about what you do? Because, I mean, you've got it down to a T. Yeah, well, it's, uh, as I said, it's a lot of investment. And let's be clear, it, it's, it's costly if you want the right logistics around you. So, and it's something I share with many founders. So it's not my own story. And it's really something that I know a lot of founders do and do the same way. By the way, something to add to what I said, do as little networking events in the night as possible. They, you know, when you look back at your life, you will regret not having spent enough evening with your kids, not at this networking event where you could have met X, Y, and Z, right? So, but um, in terms of logistics, so you need a lot of help. So for me, uh, uh, again, it was clear cut. I had twins. Uh, to, uh, if I, I did, obviously, uh, many nights, uh, sleepless nights with them, they wouldn't sleep before they, they turned uh, nine months. And we needed night nannies. Uh, just because when you have twins, the problem is they keep waking up one another. And I live in Paris, and you know, flats in Paris, you cannot have like a 500 square meters, so you cannot put them one, uh, on one side of the house and the other on the other side. So we just couldn't sleep the entire night. So if you can imagine, I don't know, for, for people that have not been parents, it's impossible to imagine how much sleep is the most important thing in your life. And uh, having twins made, made us realize with my husband that we needed night nannies. So it means 
We overinvested. It cost us actually a lot, but that was the best investment of my life. Some people don't believe me, but trust me, it was the best ROI. Having people that could just take care of them, you know, giving them food during the night was just like the relief. So that really during the day, again, to the point I was mentioning before, I could really enjoy. So that was the first nine months. Then obviously we have this full-time nanny at home, and it's actually better to have someone at home that having to bring the kid to a crash just because again like the time you lose by you know setting up the kids bringing them to the crash is again like it's probably an hour per day lost into putting the uh, all the crap that you need to go out so for us it's super easy they can stay in pajamas the nanny comes super easy and then what i took recently on top but don't get me wrong i put the entirety of my salary plus some salary of my husband into that so it's very very costly so pigment uh, get a yeah we, we hope that everything works well because otherwise it's a big sacrifice but literally the the way we make it work is um, we have this housekeeper now coming every day to actually do some cleaning at the house in the morning, cooking for the kids, cooking for us, taking care of the laundry. So really, again, the time I have with them is pure, pure, pure quality time. So it's, it costs a lot, a lot, a lot of investment, and it's also some logistics to deal with with uh, with uh, with that. But uh, it's uh, it's it's mandatory if you want to create a fast growing company. And I think we wanted to be honest with you guys about how we handle the juggle. Um, I think this is really important. A lot of people pretend that they do it all. And actually, if you, are, if you have uh, two full-time jobs, I don't know how single parents do it, by the way. Kudos to any of you who are single parents. But I think if you both have full-time jobs, getting the outside help is mandatory and getting your investors to support you to use your salary, additional support during the early months to get night nannies is really important because sleep is the most important thing in those early days for you to be able to perform. Now, we've only got three, four minutes left, so I want to go into some quick fire advice for anyone. I'm going to give my advice first and then I'm going to go to these guys. Um, so my advice is similar to Eleanor's around getting additional help. One of the things that I have is a virtual EA. Um, I employ her for through the company to help me with scheduling and some admin tasks. Um, and then I also employ her personally to help me with some of the admin around my life. So I haven't bought a birthday present for a family member and sent it in the post for years because Jude, my amazing EA, does that. I think one of the key tips here is you have to outsource everything that is not your company and your children. Um, and I don't think that having uh, a nanny or a thing is outsourcing your children. It, it, having more people around them who love them is really important. So that's my personal tip. I'm going to go to Marcelo next. Yeah, so life is unique as far as we know. Maybe it's not, but let's assume. Uh, let's, let's not assume things. So, you know, it's important to treat these experiences. They are unique. Those, those humans, they're going to grow up but they fully depend on us, right? You can fail in a company, you can start another. If you fail a kid, that's it, right? And, and yes, you can try again, but you know, they're gonna live with it throughout their lives. And so you have that unique, amazing experience to be part, to influence them, and, and, and also to learn more about yourself. So high prioritization is important, and look, for, uh, for some people, having kids is not a thing, or having a family is not a thing. To each their own, but hyper-prioritization still stands. And f as, for, as far as people go that, you know, if they're thinking about should I have kids or not, there's never a good time, ever. You know, before a company, during a company, there's always something that you think, oh my God, but this is, this is really gonna be hard. It's always gonna be hard, so. You get one shot, so have, have a family, doesn't matter when, if you yep. can, if you want to. Eleanor, final tip. Yeah, so I could not agree more that life is short. So first of all, tell your employees that life is short so that they do the same thing as you do, taking as much time as they can with their family. Because when you're a fast-growing company, your employees also work hard. And sometimes they also tend to get drawn into their work, and so it's also critical that you really try to inspire them to do, obviously, to take a lot more time than you do, if, you, if they can, because really, like, you are not a good example, and you have to tell them you are the worst example at the company, and they should not follow your life. The second is sleep, as I said. So find solutions to help you if you want to do what we've done. 
Third is follow your heart. Do as you want, meaning that you know every person is different. We don't have all the same level of energy. These are just examples, but I don't think they are for everyone. And people might have more energy than us. Some might have less. Some might have different type of energy. So just follow your heart into what you think is right for you, for your family, for the kids. Fourth. If you're a female and you live in a country where paternity leave doesn't exist, lobby the government. Lobby the government. And this is what I try to do every day. We have actually signed a paternity pact with the French Tech 120, which is a sort of French trade group of scale up in, in, in France, to actually increase drastically the time that fathers can spend with the kids. Not only because you need help, but because it's the best thing that can happen for the kids. And I'm so happy that my twins had the opportunity to spend that much time with the dad, because you can still see now today that they spend as much time with me as with my my husband, and I'm so grateful for that. So. Great advice. Uh, let's all go out lobbying for equal parental leave. Thank you so much to Eleanor and Marcel for their wonderful and candor today. We could have talked about this for hours. There are so many more things we would love to share with you about how we handle it, but hopefully this was a useful insight into how you can be a founder and a parent. It is possible. It is hard. It involves intentional trade-offs and a lot of investment, but it is a joy to have kids and to build a company. Thank you. Thank you.